Well, thank you. Um, you know, I just came off a national call where I was talking about uh, what was getting ready to happen. And so I'm excited uh, about what uh, this opportunity and this day is going to bring. I want to just, first of all, welcome everybody and just say to you uh, what a uh, privilege it is for me uh, to get to be in this space with you all today and really get to hear from our young people. Um, it's an honor for me uh, to have you now a part of the Metropolitan Action Commission team. And yes, you're a part of our team. So we're excited about all that you all are going to share today. I want to just thank our partners who I know are, are on or who are listening for all that you've done. I'm going to thank, thank Rod, even though he, okay, Rod, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, Ellen, thank you and your team for your incredible work. Kia, for your work and everyone who's been involved, the young people who's been involved in this. Uh, thank you all so much for everything that you're doing. Uh, I'm not going to take up any more of your time except to say I'm excited about what you're going to share with us today. And let's get it started. I think I am next and just let me briefly give you a little background context about Opportunity Now and how we got started with the Opportunity Youth Collaborative and how this report came about because I too am super excited about this report and this day. So some of you may be familiar with Opportunity Now as the Mayor's Youth Employment Initiative. We're now part of the Metropolitan Action Commission which expands our support of Nashville's next generation of workforce. We're especially excited about how the integration with MAC supports our work with Opportunity Youth. And Opportunity Youth are young people ages 16 to 24 who are disconnected from work and school. And prior to COVID in Davidson County, there were approximately 9,000 young people between those ages who were not working and not in school and therefore not accessing education and employment pathways that lead to economic stability. Y'all, that's like three high school graduating classes of people who were just gone, are just gone. And as we all can imagine, with COVID, the number of young adults who are disconnected has only grown. Um, Opportunity Now has invested in reconnecting Opportunity Youth from its inception, but we knew we couldn't do that just by offering jobs. Uh, the Opportunity Youth Collaborative was developed to foster the design of a re-engagement system that supports the individual capacity of opportunity use to achieve outcomes while also shaping structures that make it more probable for youth to achieve those outcomes. This collaborative does include grown-ups. Um, you'll be able to see some of our organizational partners and some of the slides that are coming, but it also includes young adults with lived experience of disconnection. And together, youth and young adults are all devoting our time to improving the systems in our city that support the economic potential of young people. And our vision has consistently been grounded in a commitment to integrating the voices, insights, wisdom, and energy of young people experiencing disconnection, not only as key informants, but also as originators of ideas and equal partners in the work itself. So with that in mind, you've, you've heard enough um, from me today, and I'm going to introduce you uh, to um, Irving and Alicia, part of our youth leadership team, who are going to manage the remainder of the meeting. Oh, please also stay engaged until the end, and then we're going to share a link to the complete report in the chat and through email. Thank you all for being here today. Is it working? Can you all see? Mm -hmm. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Irving Brown, and I've been a part of uh, the Youth Collaborative for about two years now. And, you know, it's been a great experience and I, you know, uh, can't wait to um, go over these finds with you guys. Also, my partner is um, Kaylin and, and uh, Alicia will be going after us to do her segment. So into the first one.
these are um, our preliminary findings and these are just key things that we found that are very difficult when it, when it comes to uh, servicing the youth. So the first one is fragmentations in the exiting systems of systems of support and how they align with the challenges young people experience navigating the system. So if you go to the first one in your um, bottom left hand corner, you see the justice system, you know, especially during times like this, during a pandemic and, you know, everything going on around the country. This is very critical, you know, and especially for African American, uh, that demographic and, you know, people who live in, you know, that South Nashville area. The justice system is one of the biggest um, things that hinder them from really, you know, moving forward in their endeavors, you know. If they're in the justice system, you know, they, um, they don't have access to the necessities that they need to move on, which causes them to have road blocks. On to the next one, housing. You know, as of right now, um, the employment rate is currently at 11%. And during these times, there's not many, not, not much housing. You know, Nashville is an increasingly growing city, you know. And with that being said, a lot of these families are being displaced to the outside areas, which basically takes them out of that Davidson County um, group, you know, for our target area. And these are the people who aren't being seen because they're not, they're not close enough to be in the, in the, um, brought in the broadband of you know our services if we could get the um housing fixed you know get these people closer you know in the inner city you know like um the people in joe johnson for example you know all they did was remodel the homes and actually some people said the um housing is very you know affordable you know and if we did that it would it would be a great help to all the, the to the people who need it so next is education. You know, this is one of our main roadblocks. Um, education is one of the greatest barriers. You know, if the individual doesn't graduate high school, there's um, limited access to jobs. If the person doesn't graduate college, there's even more limited access to jobs. You know, during times, you know, like this right now and before, people have many um, problems. You know, we went to a, um, a home and a lot of these individuals they they were disconnected because you know of reason that they couldn't control you know them being in foster care or them being in a bad situation or some people being of the uh, LGBT community and being kicked out of their homes or you know being too scared to go to school and you know thinking you know that their safety was going to be you know jeopardized so on to the next one and the top, very top one, career and job skills. If the people who need the services aren't available to the services, then, you know, that's where the disconnect is. And, you know, this is where I felt like this was going to um, explain it the most, you know, because we, we don't, you don't see many um, people trying to do many, you know, jobs in the system. I feel they really, they really keep you in a more blue collar mindset. You know, they have jobs, you know, construction work, um, factories, and, you know, some people can't even, can't even do that. So, you know, what, what, what needs to be done for them? Next on your top right corner, employers and employment. Um, there is a roadblock in the employment system and with and with this we're basically saying there needs to be a change oh, can you thank you uh there needs to be a change in, in you know the employment system and the um credentials that people need to have in order to be giving um certain individuals jobs you know and why you know they're withheld from them social services Social services is a, is a very critical um, issue because, you know, like I said earlier with the, with the people in those DCS homes and group homes all over Nashville, they're being moved, they're being, they're being displaced and they're not, they're not being 
cater to how they need to be. And if there's a change in that, then, you know, that'll be fulfilling the, or, you know, the goal that we're all trying to reach. And finally, health resources. You know, this is a problem, you know, and you can especially see this in the Nashville community, especially in North Nashville and South Nashville. A lot of these co um, minority communities don't have the same tools as individuals have in other areas. And if you take a person's, you know, basic necessities for, a, for a, you know, a comfortable, healthy life, then you're really, you're disconnecting them in, in that in itself. Up onto the uh, next slide, and that's uh, Kayla. All right, everybody can hear me good, right? I'm gonna take that as a yes. So the next preliminary finding we had was blocking the road. Oh, I'm sorry, and I'm Kayla. I've been with the youth leadership team for about two years. And I found a lot of enjoyment in it, and I really love the work that we do. And the second preliminary finding was blocking the road. And these roadblocks are things that stand in opportunity use way of finding their path and their way to, like, work in education. Things can be, it could be things such as just not being able to find the mode of transportation, not being able to just find the resources that exist out there for them. So that, that's what would count as like blocking the road, those things that are hard to come over like individually. So getting job opportunities and being able to be employed, feeding off of what Irvin said previously, a lot of youth hit that roadblock when they're actually going out there to find a job, but then the job requirements are so high and they tell you something like, was to hire you, you have to have job like work experience, but you can't get the experience if no one hires you because they're a little younger or maybe they don't have all the requirements because they haven't had time to grow in the system. And those things prevent them from growing and coming out of that opportunity youth path. And it's just it's just a block for them. It's exactly as it's read. It's a roadblock. That's something that keeps you from, even if they're trying to obtain their goals, it's going to stop them and it's going to be a major setback. And it's something that we have to do to make sure that they don't continuously hit those roadblocks and that they don't continuously become shut down so that they can grow, whether that's you know, giving them some support they need, wherever they can find that support. If we provide those things to them, it'll be beneficial and their growth and it's just it's just something that we have to work on and I was going to say I, I'm really happy that everybody's here today because I feel like this is like exactly what we've been needing to clear up those roadblocks to understand them more and another roadblock for you could be understanding them you know I'm glad that we have people our age working in the system to perfect things to get things understood so we can clear up those barriers and make sure that things get seen that should be seen. Because you know, when you have older people, not calling anybody else, but just like not you, you have to like consider the way our minds work differently. So our paths are gonna be set up differently. So it's just really important that we get to those details and we block and we break down those roads. And I just, I feel like that's like a great point. You know, I just wanna make sure we all understand that. And we can move on to the third one if Irvin would like to add anything to that or continue on. Can you hear me? Okay, so as we're um, going on with this one, I'm gonna ask uh, you to jump back a few times and I'll tell you when. But um, this, the third finding is, our, oh, not, not yet. The third, the third is um, barriers to employment and education and how it accumulates with age. So now, now you can go back. So um, from the uh, previous slide, you know, there's a lot of um, barriers. And what we saw through the um, groups and all the you know, research that was conducted, we saw that it differs through the age brackets, you know, and that's, you know, that's a common thought you know as people grow up there's different factors that are introduced into their lives that help them you know either to grow or you know uh, worse so looking at the chart 
the first section would be more trivial to people around that 16 to 24 bracket. So that's lack of motivation. You see it's at um, 29% to education Roblox and it's about 25% to employment Roblox. But when you, when you, you know, 29, 25 seems like such a small number, but when you think about, you know, the tens and hundreds of thousands of people in the actual metropolitan Davidson County area, the, you know, that target group is actually very large. Moving on to lack of knowledge of opportunities. If they don't know what's out there, then they can't, you know, they can't be serviced. And, you know, what we were trying to do with the, um, with the correspondence letters, you know, we're really trying to figure out what we're getting um, mail and, um, you know, trying to um, work on the, you know, social media so that people who are on these, you know, sites, they can, they can see it and they can know that, you know, there's help out there for them, especially in the Nashville area. Moving on, I feel like mental health and substance abuse, that's like a big, um, big factor across all age groups, you know, especially, you know, in Nashville with the um, opioid crisis. Um, moving on, community and interpersonal. So that's lack of support, uh, family issues, child care, household responsibilities, financial problems, and violence in your neighborhood. This is more 6 to 24 age range. And, you know, for the second half, it's um, toward that, that higher uh, age group. And you, and you see the trend um, from lack of support to the violence in the neighborhood. It usually starts out, you know, with lack of support. And then it adds on, you know, with people who have families. Everybody has, you know, things that go on at home. You know, some people, you know, are worse than most. And with this, with this research, we found a lot of these stories. And, you know, and you know it's really sad to think about that these people are They've been here and they they've continued to they've continued to seek help and nobody knew that, you know, how to help them and they didn't know how to get the help. So once again, like Kayla was saying, it's really glad that, you know, you all are here to, you know, so we can make the difference that needs to be made. Um, lastly, social and institutional. You know, a lot of people in these neighborhoods, you know, you know, uh, especially in Nashville, once again, like Transportation is a big issue, you know, right now we, you know, we have WeGo, but, in some, you know, that doesn't branch out to certain areas. And that's one thing that um, they've been trying to get done too, especially with um, Bus Stop Strong, and that's a um, group with um, the Oasis Center. Uh, moving forward, um, learning difficulties, lack, lack, lack of access to technology, housing once again, medical issues and legal issues. With all these um, findings tied, you can see, you know, how these roadblocks can you know, hinder a person and why they're, and why they're so critical to be, to be met. Okay, so the fourth preliminary finding was caring adults. And I first want to start by making sure, like, we all understand caring adults. And I want you all to know, like, a caring adult can be in any position. And it can mean different things to different people. It depends on what background you come from or where you find that trust in an adult. So we know that caring adults can be found in education system. It could be a teacher. And, you know, but most opportunity use out of school, so it might not be that position. It could be a neighbor, it could be someone you find around you, and they just give, they give you a certain amount of trust and understanding. And to make this work and to get opportunity use further in their journey, we have to put caring adults in place. Like with the different systems we have set up, like Martha O'Brien and things like that, it's important that we have caring adults in those positions because if I go somewhere and I'm reaching out and I say I need help or someone reaches out to me, I want to feel like that I'm in trusted hands. Someone's going to take care of me. I, I just want to know that I'm in a position of someone who actually cares instead of someone who's just doing a job. I don't want to feel like a paycheck. 
And I think that's really important that, like, we get that out there and people understand how to be a caring adult. When you're put in a position to where you can help somebody and you can give them that trust and understanding, it's so important that you seize that opportunity because it helps those people who don't have those. And when opportunity youth don't have caring adults, that's when that system shutdown comes. And that can also come before becoming an opportunity youth. Say someone, so I'm say someone's in high school, you know, it's their last year, but they could, like Irvin said, a lot of people go through things at home, say I'm reaching out and I'm not able to find someone in the school system who can help me. And I'm reaching out and I'm reaching out and I go places. I'm like, you know, we don't have this at home. I need this. And the people that I come to, they don't have their hearts open. They're not, they're just like, okay, whatever. Then at that point, I start to break down on the inside and I, I'm not able to reach the points that I need to reach and it's just and it, that becomes like a part where you become an opportunity you so it's important that we we can prevent that with caring adults not only like help someone who's became an opportunity youth, but we can prevent that and that just it makes it more of a success story if we can prevent those things from happening and yeah it's just like caring adults I just I can't stress it enough it's one of the most important things like over the, I feel like it's over the surveys and the research and we got to do this and we need to do this. Like caring adults are so important. It is the first step. It keeps somebody from walking off that edge into a life that they didn't have to go into. And it's important that we place these people and we have training and we make sure everybody knows what they're doing. They're open. They have sympathy, empathy, whatever they need. Like that is so important for anybody, even if you're not an opportunity youth, it's just, it's a great way to have somebody in your life that can support you. And that's all I had to say on caring adults, and I would like to hand it over to my co-partner, Alicia, if you'd like to take it from there. Sure, Kaylin. <laughs> I can hear my echo, sorry. Um, so I am Alicia Alexi. I am a peer support worker at oops, make sure yeah. uh, Monroe Har yes Monroe Harding's reengagement hub. Um, I've also been a part of the youth leadership team since roughly March, maybe early March. Um, so yeah. Um, so through these findings, we've also discovered opportunities for improvement. Um, this includes leadership, coordination of system partners, and strengthening oops, system alignment. Those wonderful words. Um, can we go to the next slide? Oh. So, and also I would like to um, remind you these um, findings can be found in the full uh, OIC report. I believe someone mentioned earlier that will be in the chat and that will be emailed to you. So look for that. Um, so the first one is uh, Opportunity One, Incorporate Youth Voice and Leadership. Um, Sorry, I'm just looking at my notes. Um, at the foundation of our research, we want for everyone to know that opportunity youth are experts. When young people are not invited to lead and further, it further reinforces structural inequities. So this can look like, um, say, and I'm using this example because Monroe Harding is an organization that services youth that are in foster care or aging out of foster care. So uh, let's say there's a person who's been in foster care or aging out of foster care. They have lived, lived experiences and maybe there's a task force or an executive board meeting and these executive board meetings which are primarily, um, primary include adults, and they're um, wondering what they should do about like helping guide 
uh, youth um, who's been in foster care to successful outcomes and exit pathways, it would be very beneficial for this executive board or task force or what have you to include uh, a youth with lived experience, especially in foster care, because it shows that that um, adult partner values that youth's voice and to have that expert in the room, it shows that um, these community partners really care about changing some of these outcomes uh, for the youth that they're serving. If that makes any sense. Um, yes. Next slide, I think. If, yeah. So the third one is coordination of system partners, uh, equip providers for effective relationships. I'm going to read this off. Um, opportunity to youth. Uh, need and want to build strong relationships with peers and caring adults to help them wrestle with the complexity of the challenges they face. So like was, what was mentioned before, having a caring adult to build that strong relationship is very vital because if a youth feels like they can't trust the adult or their peers, then it, it feels like they're being alienated from the process of, can I be successful as a youth with all these sort of barriers? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, next slide, if we want to go to that one. Okay. So opportunity number four is add a focus on financial stability. So I believe um, COVID-19, um, we all experience it in some way, how it might affect certain barriers for people. A lot of that um, is seen through unemployment and so with COVID, there's a lot of financial instability, especially for youth who may have been recently unemployed, who are having a hard time finding work, who are um, who are maybe competing with older adults to get um, employment, and this is a very sensitive time. So financial survival and everything that comes with that is very crucial. So to be financially stable in these times is, uh, like I said, very crucial, very important. Um, there you go. Thank you. Next slide. Sorry if I sound really awkward, but I'm an awkward person by nature. So uh, we have our breakout rooms. Um, these will be led by youth. Um, that, can, that includes youth from, the, um, from this presentation, also people, oh, thank you. Um, sorry. Also who presented and some youth that are, are in the youth leadership team will also be participating in these conversations. So with that being said, let's break out into our various rooms. So I will put you into breakout rooms. Give me just a moment and I'll make sure that there is a youth in each one of those rooms. But you have some questions here and I also will send them to you. Um, the first group will be centering voices. What does it mean to incorporate and collaborate with youth voices? So we really want to hear from our youth leadership team regarding that. Uh, barriers to success, we want to expand on what those barriers look like and invite you to have a conversation regarding that and then strengthening that support for education and career pathways and what tools really is needed for that stability. So let me put you into breakout rooms. There are a lot more of you and that's a good thing than anticipated. So give me just one moment.
while she's doing that, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody here for your words of um, encouragement and, like, compliments and all, because I wasn't really able to say anything, like, during the presenting, so I just wanted to say thank you. Irving. So now that we have most people back into the room, uh, I'll, let me give it back over to uh, Darius, uh, Shar, Alicia, Irving, and Kaylin so that they can have a brief conversation about what was discussed in those breakout rooms. Did I start or? Yeah, you can. What did you all talk Are about? We, okay. So some of the barriers we um, talked about, oops, sorry, I think my um, AC is about to come. So uh, one of the things we talked about um, is housing, how that can be a huge barrier for youth, especially opportunity youth. Um, we talked about um, barriers as far as like whether or not a youth is connected with a caring, car uh, caring adult. Um, and how that's beneficial and to not have that, what kind of what kind of path is that person gonna head down without having a caring adult? We talked about access to transportation, education, how that can affect the youth and their um, success. Um, we also talked about how, um, and if I can call on, if I can mention Melody, um, how um, a documented youth, a documented youth probably face a lot of barriers because of um, um, papers or uh, documents or 
um, we or DACA um, for like people who are who who are trying to pursue four year degrees and that being possibly affected. So those were some of the things. If anyone from that um, our breakout group wants to like sound on any of the things that I mentioned because um, I'm sure I'm probably missing some things, but yeah. Oh, sorry. And um, I also wanted to mention, we also talked about how criminal, uh, how being incarcerated and how that affects um, youth and the barriers to, to success. Um, If no one else had any follow-up from that group, I would like to jump in on mine, if that's okay. Okay. So um, we discussed barriers in my group, and we started off the conversation, and I got into um, financial literacy as being one of the biggest barriers, and I got a lot of feedback from my group about how, you know, a lot of things weren't um, given out like educationally, there wasn't a lot of financial literacy taught, and we have to understand where we're coming from. Like when you're teaching these opportunity youth financial literacy, who they are, where they came from, how to distribute the information to them, and um, caring adults. And I think I heard Alicia mention that as well. Like we jumped into how that can feed into those things because, you know, the people in the position to give you that information usually have to be caring adults so they can understand your situation. And I remember um, some comments, we got a lot of comments about, you know, spreading that information family-wise, because someone was discussing generational wealth, and I think wealth, and I think that's very important, you know. A lot of things can root down from parents, from opportunity to you. If you weren't seeing someone before you understand how to money manage and how to get over those barriers and how to develop, then it becomes like a systematical thinking and it gets into your head and you're not able to like process those things. So it's important that we get that information out there to not for opportunity youth can reach that information, but we can get some information out there to families and just make sure that that's a lesson that's being taught because finance, finances stand to be the biggest barrier for anyone. If you can't get into school, the next thing you want to do is get a job. But then if you can't get a job, because maybe you don't know how to, like the youth might not know how to reach out and go get those opportunities and how to fill out a job application. Well, that comes in with financial literacy, learning how to discuss certain things such as that. And if anybody else wants to jump in on that, and I noticed we did get some comments. Um, well, uh, you can go. All right. Um, well, jumping off of uh, Kaylin, my group, we also talked about, um, you know, main, you know, people, uh, the barriers. And just to reiterate what, you know, what these main barriers are is transportation, learning difficulties, housing, legal issues, family issues, child care, financial problems, and violence. Um, we talked about these issues and we really discussed how they all tied into one another, you know, in a sense, you know, a lot of these issues, they start out when you're young. And that was, you know, the point of the slide where you see the, you see the age brackets and you see the breakdown of it. 16 and up, they're starting to have the, you know, you know, they're seeing difficulties with their learning. And we also discussed learning difficulties also doesn't mean, um, you know, like an IEP. Learning difficulties can, can it, it's why, you know, it's very broad. You can talk about mood disorders, bipolar disorder, many things that hinder your learning. You know, it's not always, it's, it's not always, you know, school level. We also talked about um, housing, um, family issues, and, you know, this tied back into the uh, previous study that we did with the um, homeless population. Uh, you know, my group, I, we spoke about this, a lot of the homeless population 
in Nashville were of, of the LGBT community and they were and they were, you know, at risk of being harmed. There was a lot of domestic violence going on. There's a lot of there's you know, there's a lot of um sexual assault going on, especially with the uh, the transportation systems. You know, like, you know, I didn't I didn't get get the person who was speaking, but she, you know, spoke to a point and you know, if she couldn't make that bus at six o'clock, you know, it was a fine, it was, it was, how, how, how are you going to get home? You know, people who don't, who aren't trivial to the uh, necessities of basic life, that, that's a very, that's hard. That's a hard, that's a hard thing to think about. Like, how am I going to get home? Legal issues. If somebody is in the legal system, it makes it 10 times harder for, for, for somebody to, for somebody to, you know, get a job and become reconnected. All right. Um, I like uh, what Irvin has said, uh, definitely with the, the legal issues and definitely getting a job as well, um, because that does go hand in hand. And it is unfortunate, you know, that it is harder for people who have been through that to, you know, to actually try to get back uh, engaged into society. Um, so that's a good point. Um, I'm here. I want to uh, talk about my group as well. Uh, we also, we talked about the barriers to success. Uh, so some great things that had came up in conversation was, um, is that I think, yes, Amy was the one who said um, a lot of employers and like the adult uh, age range, they think about the external barriers a lot. Like why can't people get to, get to their jobs on time or why can't people go to class on time? You know, if you're in college, but they don't, what they fail to realize is that opportunity youth and just youth in general have a lot of internal barriers as well. And internal barriers are just as important as those external barriers. And I kind of spoke with her about, excuse me, about how important it is just for those internal barriers to be just as important as those external barriers. Um, and one thing that we found in a finding uh, is that older youth um, I, like b between the ages between the 16 to 24, the older demographic, they have about two to three as times, about um, about as uh, two or three or more times around the barriers that the opportunity that the younger opportunity youth face, and that's just because the younger youth, obviously they're in school, they're being cared for by their parents, so they only have a couple barriers. But when the older youth, the 18 to 24 and obviously the ones that live on their own, they face be, uh, bigger barriers because now they have to worry about financial situations, then have to worry about housing, then they have to worry about, you know, all this other stuff that goes on. And I know we had a question in the chat that says, can you go into detail about these barriers? Um, so as far as the barriers, there are two types, and uh, there are two types of barriers that we talk about. There are internal barriers, and then there's external barriers. Um, your internal barriers are things that obviously reside within yourself. Obviously things like self-esteem, your motivation, your emotional well-being, things like that. Your external barriers are things that kind of are not out of your control, like transportation. Uh, some people, you know, and one another one thing that, that me and Amy had talked about was the lack of knowledge. And that, that one makes a lot of sense too, because the older demographic, like I was referring to earlier, they have a lack of knowledge, which sounds a little bit more crazy, but that's more in the communication aspect. And that's because uh, when you're younger and in school, you obviously find these, uh, these, you're in a classroom setting. So you're kind of forced to learn that knowledge. But when you're older, you're not forced to go to school. You're not forced to sustain that knowledge. So that's another external barrier that we talked about. So the barriers are things that basically keep uh, youth away or anyone away from trying to get a certain goal that they're trying to obtain. Would anybody else like to jump in um, before I speak? Uh, I just want to make some uh, uh, last points on uh, uh, the external and internal. A lot of, and you know, especially, you know, since we're talking about the 16 to 24 age range, 
which is college students and graduate students. You know, if, you know, a lot of these students have, you know, motivation, pro motivation problems, self-esteem issues, but more importantly, mental health and uh, substance abuse issues and confidence issues, college brings out the best and the worst in all people, you know, and it really shows you, you know, what, what, you know, what you're going to do in life. And when people don't know, don't know what they're going to do, it makes it even harder because they don't have the, the opportunity to hone in on a certain skill to make them better. And that, and, you know, that causes a lack of motivation because they don't, you know, they don't know what they want to do. One, and, you know, on to the next thing, one of the main problems that we see on college campuses is mental health and substance abuse. Been, like binge drinking is like 80 percent in college campuses, and this is and this is these are studies done all over the country. A lot of a lot of students go through some type of depression, some type of mood disorder. Some people, you know, have a bipolar disorder. There's a lot of mental health issues, and especially in Nashville, there's a lot of mental health disparities, especially in these under underserved communities. If I could just jump in there, I wanted to um, refer to some things that were in the chat. Um, someone asked about making the information stick, like so people have like access to knowledge and that's how to make the information stick. And I think it's very important, like when you're like talking to youth and trying to get the information in the head, that comes with understanding who you're talking to again. So gaining a relationship to, with the person you're teaching it gives you like access to like how they think and how they respond to certain things. So building relationships is really important. And someone else asked, um, was one of the various lack of experience in about knowledge or something like that. And I was gonna say to my information of what they were saying, I was gonna say yes. Lack of knowledge about how to go and get certain things really feeds into becoming an opportunity youth and holding people back but you guys can continue on i would like to branch off of that too caitlin because i feel like um i i really wanted to say no to that last question just because i feel like it's lack of accessibility a lot of people don't have access to a lot of these things a lot of people don't have access to caring adults who are willing to help them and go the extra mile to help them find those problem solving steps or even just find um, um, another resource who knows more um, and to be quite frank a lot of people in Nashville a lot of adults not even young adults don't know what the next steps are. I know a lot of grown people who call their mama for a doctor's appointment. Anyways, um, <laughs> I um, really do think that if we strengthen um, how we find resources and how we make them accessible to youth now, we will be able to teach the younger generations that come up after our um, opportunity youth how to find those resources themselves. Um, I definitely want to go ahead and wrap up though, because we are very long time. Um, but we talked about my group, group nine talked about, I mean, group 10 talked about what tools help provoke stable, like education, employment, finances, and things like that. We, um, kind of reiterated, um, a lot about supporting, building support networks and caring adults which I feel like was kind of a given, but at the same time, um, I can see why it's so important to everybody, especially after listening to the report that we, um, we just heard and everything. Because caring adults can help you access resources and things too, but I really would like to um, be able to continue this conversation and find out what tools that are more specific other than human interaction would, um, help us stabilize these issues with the barriers that we have. Um, I definitely feel like a lot of things go into provoking stable stability in general, um, like employment, transportation, and um, employment for money, <laughs> transportation and housing, having a good environment, 
having the means um, to be able to find resources for yourself is a great thing. Um, and is if you hear kids in the background, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I do not know how to shut them up. It's not my job. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I definitely feel like a stable environment and a stable bank account. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> Is a, is a big thing when it comes down to being stable in general. Um, so I hope that we can find, as working as a collaborative that we are, I hope that we can find more resources and more ways to help build up our opportunity use so that Nashville can be the best that it can be possibly um, with the strong backbone of the youth. So I guess if we could hear from some people in the re-engagement hub to um, wrap this up. Sure, I can talk about um, the re-engagement hub at Monroe Harding. So our um, re-engagement hub, um, we're fairly new. We launched around, I believe, early February of this year. Um, what we mainly do or our uh, purpose of the re-engagement hub is to uh, connect or reconnect uh, our opportunity youth to um, either school. So um, that could be like getting their high set or enrolling to college or even a trade school and either connecting to employment. So either um, getting a job, um, maybe developing career school skills to change careers, what have you. And we also uh, provide additional support. So that could be in a form of just being able to relate to someone who's in the similar age bracket. Because uh, I think uh, it's one thing to just not only to find a caring adult, but also to be aligned with a person who's had lived experiences such as themselves. Um, yes. With one, with one of the youth from the other um, engagement hub like to speak out? All right, I guess I'll do that. Um, so uh, my name is Darius. Again, I'm from uh, Martha O'Brien. I am a peer support worker. And just basically the same thing that we were going through um, was everything that Alicia said, we're going through employment and in uh, employment and education. So hey, Violet. Uh, oh, <laughs> it's OK. Um, but yes, so uh, everything Lisa says is the same thing that we do. We try to engage through uh, social media and stuff like that. Uh, so um, yeah, that's it. Um, okay, so propose next topic session dates. Um, youth experience during COVID, August 25th, 2 p.m. Uh, barriers to safe and affordable housing for opportunity youth at September 29th at 2 p.m. And thirdly, or uh, lastly, financial empowerment for opportunity youth. Uh, that's on October 27th at 2 p.m. Uh, I want to do a quick thank you before we all head out. I just want to say thank you to all the youth leadership team uh, who's on the staff, all of you guys who organized it. I wanted to say thank you to Kia, L, and uh, for just helping us set this up. Thank you to all the partners and Dr. Kroon, and thank you for everyone who listened. So I hope y'all have a great day and thank you again. Bye you guys, hope you hope it was informative. I kind of feel bad because I never introduced myself and I forgot to change my name on this thing. So um, for everyone who is still here, I am sure. Hi Rod. Thank you to anybody who has left for listening and being a part of this.
It was very appreciated. I'm going to head out, though. Great hey, job, guys. Great job. Outstanding. Thanks, guys.